This trigger film was developed for health services to use as part of an experience-based co-design process, EBCD. EBCD is a patient-centred quality improvement process. The film is intended to get local people, patients, families and NHS staff talking together about how they can jointly improve people's experience of health services. You can find out more about this process and how to use trigger films by accessing this link to the EBCD toolkit. This film draws from a collection of 31 interviews with people who are caring for someone with dementia. The interviews were conducted across the UK by the Health Experiences Research Group at the University of Oxford. It includes people talking about what it's like to become a carer, getting support, making difficult decisions and about dealing with emotions. The full study can be seen on www.healthtalk.org. We'd like to know more about how you use this or other trigger films in the collection and would be grateful if you would spend a few minutes completing our feedback form. The link to this is on this page. I don't think I, I even thought of anybody else looking after her, to be quite honest. I mean, I, I met her when we were 14 and we'd been together all our lives, more or less, so I wasn't going to part with it to somebody else. <laughs> no, no way. I certainly couldn't have looked after and the children and I couldn't have looked after and continued working. Um, and there came a point when it, it, when it came to a choice between and the children, I had to choose the children. But it was never a decision that I put much thought into because I say it was never a decision I intended to make. It was made for me by the circumstances and by the fact that I just could not continue to keep at home. Once he started needing personal care, um, it was bad enough keeping the system going around um, once needed looking after rather than just a safe environment to survive in then it was more than, I think it's more than one person can do. But I think you gradually slot into this role of carer if somebody came along and said to you you're going to be a carer in two years time a full-time carer you say no way no way but because it sneaks up on you um, you take it on and until something goes whomp like that and makes you think no I can't cope anymore you just carry on doing it and un without realizing a little bit more is eroding a little bit more is happening a little bit more is happening a little bit more is happening like you know now he can't speak now he he's incontinent um, uh, you know now he needs 24-hour care all the things that if you were given at a certain point said this is what's down the road for you would say no way no way no way but you just slot into it so I didn't I don't consider I took on I made a conscious decision to take on the role of carer I think it was just part of my life with me. my life with me now involves taking care of him which I never thought it would that was never in my um, mind when we first got together but having said that I couldn't at the moment put him into residential care and have any sort of peace myself because I'm not ready to let him go and I don't think he's ready to have to go into residential care I think he's still able to although he doesn't show it he's still able to enjoy the outside world and I want him to experience as much of the outside world as as we can while he's still able to while he's still fit the other thing that I haven't mentioned which was a terrible trauma for us if it wasn't Alzheimer's and we're not really sure what it is well now that opens up huge possibilities for a wife who's grappling with horrendous possibilities it's all very very early stages I actually started bullying and saying, look, will you try harder? If you try harder, 
you might not do these things wrong. If you try harder, you might remember X, Y, and Z. And that was horrible, and I bitterly regret that. You know, if I had known more, I would never have put through that. And I think I, I caused to doubt the validity of what was he ill? Was he well? Should he go back to work? I certainly doubted it because I was not being helped to find a proper diagnosis. That was dreadful. So yes, I, I wish that I had just gone on saying, look, he's ill. Will somebody listen to me? I think that it's very easy to um, run yourself into the ground, keep going at all costs, and that cost might well be your own health. Um, so I think it's important too that you've got to take care of yourself, otherwise you're not going to be in a position to uh, carry on caring. Um, so it's important that you look after yourself by eating regularly, by having time out. It's important to get time out, to get away from the caring role, um, which eventually becomes 24 hours a day. And it's very important to get out and, if you can, to relax, enjoy yourself, and still accept that uh, there is a life outside the caring role. Um, so apart from being a carer and taking care of the person with dementia, you've also got to care for yourself. I think that I could have received a lot more support and a lot more information um, which indirectly could have helped my wife because once I started reading about dementia and understanding some of the problems then I could face, not face my wife, but I could face the situation a lot easier. I found that I had to try and think on behalf of my wife and for my wife um, because she was now long, no longer able to um, think for herself and it's putting yourself in their position and trying to understand um, the difficulties that they have then I found the more you can obviously help them. Most helpful I think I have found reading experience and articles of other carers. <coughs> I think that um, just the simple little experiences like I previously mentioned about the clothes um, about food, um, they're the most helpful things I, I found. I found the support from the CPN tremendously helpful. Once we had a, a CPN allocated, and of those, the CPN theoretically, um, is for he spent a lot of time giving me support and help uh, and I got a lot of advice, a lot of support um, uh, from him. So I think the two most helpful things have been reading articles and the support of the, of the CPN. I, th I think one of the things is to be able to get information and help when, when you need it 
rather than to have to fight everybody all the way to get the rights for, for, your, for your loved one or your mother or your dad or whoever's got dementia. I found throughout the time we were looking after I was constantly fighting people backwards and forwards for rights of this, that and the other. Um, it, it just, I just took it as a battle in the end. E even, even before I spoke to people, I was ready to, to argue with them if they went against, you know, what I was trying to do. So I was, I was sort of hyped up before I started. <laughs> but I, I did find it difficult to, to try and, it's as if I was talking to them and they weren't understanding what I was saying half the time. And then we had to go and look at residential homes and again it was left entirely to us to do it, which is all very fine, but when you live at a distance, how do you, how do you find a residential home? And the social worker wasn't an enormous amount of help. And I know there's these lists you can go and look at, but again, it's a question of looking at them during the week. The most helpful side of, of support is, I'm sure, the kind of emotional support that you get. I mean, I think the the practical day-to-day -day things, although they're useful, uh, is not something I've, you know, I've needed to worry about. I think the most helpful is the kind of emotional support you get from a group of people who say, we're going through this as well, or we've been through it, um, and, you know, we know what what your experiences are. That's hugely um, supportive and helpful, I think, and I wouldn't be without that kind of, uh, that kind of help. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it is about, the dilemma all the time is about truth-telling, isn't it? It's about telling the truth to people about what is happening to them, about changes in their care, in their physical condition. Um, and I think we spend a lot of time when carers get together debating that issue, whether one is absolutely truthful in what you say with people uh, or whether one is justified sometimes in um, maintaining people in a, in a position of ignorance. And I think that's a very, a very profound issue and one which troubles me a lot and one which uh, I haven't got a consistent line on. I, I've tr I think I started out thinking I must be open, I must tell the truth about everything to um, And maybe I don't always do that now. I've compromised slightly. But I think that's a very profound issue indeed. Because I think any good relationship is built on truth-telling and, and trust and now suddenly uh, you, it might not always be possible to, to do that in the way that you would like, and that's very sad and very, very profound, I think. But I feel the real letdown was lack of support for me, the carer, throughout, really. Lack of support and advice. As I was told that she needed a home, residential care, adamant that she definitely needed one and um, you know the social worker would, would well she brought me some brochures and she was a very nice I was lucky she's a very nice social worker but and they're not allowed to sort of suggest a home I, I can see why um, but nobody actually gave me any um, guidance or moral support actually Perhaps it's presumptuous of me to expect it, but I would have thought other carers would be in the same position would need. My goodness, you need some sort of emotional and 
moral support and guidance because you can't think straight. I mean, there I was suffering because I remember coming out of it and breaking down in tears outside. And they had actually sent the nurse out, so they must have known probably that would happen because we were very level headed and nice with each other and in there. And, um, and so you're coping, or I found, I was coping with mum inside there, trying to keep her happy, coping with the emotional turmoil that was going on inside me and trying to think logically about what I was going to do, how I was going to find these homes, how I was going to find the time to go and see the homes and how I knew what homes to go to. And, and there's nobody, nobody to... Maybe hospitals should have somebody, you know, doing that sort of job. It doesn't have to be a doctor necessarily. So, um, yes, that was, the le that was the weak point at that point. And I think another turning point was a realisation that, um, and this comes quite late on, that the carer is the expert. You know far more about your, uh, the person you're caring for than all the doctors and the workers put together. You, can, you know the whole picture. You are the expert. And again, I'm just, that sounds arrogant, but um, a carer's voice must be heard, I think, in, in planning out what is right and proper for the person you're caring for. Uh, and if you feel that something is wrong, then you've got to have the guts to say so. Whether it's to do with the care, with the medication, um, with anything to do with their well-being, if you feel that something is not as it should be. And it's very hard, but you have to speak up as politely and as firmly, but firmly as you can. And that was another turning point, because I just assumed that I was just a carer and everybody else was the expert. But they all know, it's as though they all have bits of our jigsaw, but they don't have the picture on the box. And the carer has the picture on the box and knows what it looks like. And I was talking about letting go. Um, I found it very difficult to put into a nursing home. Um, because A, he seemed so young. He was, I think, 57 at the time. Uh, but also, it was, I was having to acknowledge that, well, I thought I had failed. That I couldn't give him the care he required without exhausting and doing my own health in. That was really the bottom line. And so there was an, a tremendous feeling of guilt in putting him into a home. And accepting that other people can deliver the care, learning to, learning to let go. The difficult part for me in the middle phase of the illness was dealing with a man who became practically a stranger. And I think this is the most traumatic thing that can ever happen to a couple, to a relationship. Because um, they're behaving in ways which are bizarre, out of character, and certainly for aggression, this was very, um, very hard for me to take. And you, I found that I actually reached a point of beginning to hate him, and hated him for what he was doing to me, hated him for what he was doing to the house, in a way hated him for making a prisoner of me, as well as of himself, this tremendous feeling of being caged, which it just is, being a carer, you are caged. Admit to yourself how you feel. Because I think I have gone through all the negative emotions that a human being is able to go through. Anger, terrible, terrible anger at the whole situation that means has been um, hit by this awful thing. 
I know there are thousands of other people in exactly the same, well, not exactly the same situation, to whom it's happening, and I have every sympathy for them. I hope they don't feel as strongly as I do. The terrible anger about the situation, the terrible anger towards him personally, and then the guilt, because it's not his fault. He didn't choose to be like this. In fact, he'd be appalled if he could see himself. The terrible grief. I got a book out of the library on understanding dementia, and it said dementia is like a continual bereavement, because unlike a proper bereavement where you have the great grief when you lose the person because they die. You've got, you're losing a bit of that person all the time and you're watching it happen. So day after day you're grieving for the bit, perhaps the next bit that's going or the bit that suddenly comes to you that day. So terrible grief. A few weeks ago, and I can't remember what brought it on, I suddenly started to think about as he used to be. And he used to think, and I started to think, what a smashing chap he was. I met him in later life. I had already been separated from my husband about three years. Um, he'd been separated from his wife about 12 years. And I met him by chance. If I look back and remember how he was, that was the man he used to be, and that's the real man. That's the real man. And I started writing it down on the computer my memories of his and my relationship and I found that helped a lot because I was not just focusing on what is now but what was and what could have been and what should have been if everything had gone you know normally okay. so that was a turning point uh, but I'm having quite a problem sorting out my lifestyle now because um, the house seems very quiet and um, with nobody seriously to sit down and eat a meal that I've cooked, I find it very difficult to um, really enjoy it the way I did before. And um, as I say, I'm getting a lot of help, um, but I don't see the carers anymore now because now that he's in full time care, they. Um, have more on their workload with other people who really need their help and uh, since there's no aid needed for their for any further showering and etc like that so I'm just left now with the lady coming today who is a psychiatric nurse for the area who's going to um, just have a general chat and see if I'm okay and then I'll be um, on my own the interesting thing about the final turning point, which of course on our death, was that just after the initial uh, emotional impact was the tremendous relief that it brought, you know. Again, something that made you feel slightly guilty, but you had to reconcile your yeah, feeling of guilt, you had to balance it with the fact that it was so much better for her. She'd stopped suffering, she'd gone peacefully, she'd gone without pain. You'd done your best. So really you didn't really need to feel all that guilty. <laughs>